Hello, welcome to this episode of The Martial Truth. Why train kata? Um, I started training in uh, 1979 in Ishinru Karate and um, obviously started learning kata almost right away. Um, was always told kata was a very important aspect of the training. Um, but certain things I was told as to why kata was an important aspect of the training. I've come to understand now um, and believe that that just isn't the case. That kata is extremely important, but there's a lot of misconceptions as to why kata is important and why we should train kata. So <clears throat> let's look at, first off, more ancient arts that are far older than karate. So I have a lot of experience in various Japanese kodu. I've studied um, so Suishiru Jiu Jitsu for over 40 years. I've studied Tenshin Shodan Katori Shintaru for over 15 years. I briefly studied Yagyu Shinkageru, okay, for a few years. Um, and I studied uh, Shindo Musuru Jodo for over 30 years, all right? Um, so the way they train kata, all those arts, is it's two-man kata. So, for instance, in um, Sosuishiru, which is um, a style that is mostly uh, Jiu-Jitsu and Ei jitsu okay, the Ei jitsu are single-man sword forms. The Jiu-Jitsu forms are two-man sword forms, where the one person attacks and the other one has to defend. So again, initially, the way I was trained in the kata for the Sosuishiru was, you know, the person attacks... You block, you counter, you do the technique, whatever it be, a, ju a, a joint lock or a throwing technique, and then you do the finishing technique. And initially, it was very static. It was he attacks, block, counter, follow through, finishing technique, okay? And the attack wasn't really, there wasn't a lot of intent in the attack. So... As I trained longer and longer, and you know, being a police officer and being involved in violent confrontations on a regular basis, um, I started basically uh, turning up the heat in my own dojo. And I had people say, I had told people, okay, well, when, you, when you're supposed to cut the neck, you have to try to cut the neck. And it's up to your partner to actually be able to defend against that. And then I started emphasizing to kind of pull out the stop signs. In other words, it wasn't block, then counter. It was those things were done at the same time. So you're stopping his attack and striking him simultaneously, then moving into your follow-up techniques. Okay? Uh, in doing this, you don't get, give the opponent a chance to change his plan. Okay? So, but I notice in modern times, a lot of the Japanese kodu training, um, there's no intent in the attacks. Um, it's become choreography. Um, so many of the two-man uh, kata practice in these various arts, and again, this isn't true of all dojo. It's really a dojo by dojo uh, situation. Um, when I trained in Jodo um, in Yoyogi, Japan, um, there was a lot of intent. I mean, people were trying to cut you with the sword, and if you screwed up, you often got hit, okay? But um, you get hit once and you realize um, that kind of hurts. Uh, it's a wood sword. Um, I don't want to have that happen anymore. And you figure out how to do the technique properly so you can defend properly. So, so that intent in two-man kata training is probably the most vital and important aspect of two-man kata training. So if you're just going through the motions, um, which is primarily what I see a lot of now, is a chore choreographed two-man um, practice, not where one is intentionally trying to strike the other and that person has to actually be able to defend against that attack. Um, the thing to keep in mind with a two-man kata practice is often um, in virtually every art I've studied, 
the senior person performs the attacking role first. And the logic is if the attack isn't done right, the defense can't possibly be done right. So, so the attack has to be strong. It has to be intent. It has to be an attempt to actually strike the other person. Now, if you're a raw beginner and you're first learning the kata, obviously you're learning choreography. That's total, that's part of the progression. The problem is we've, we're seeing, and I'm seeing, that it often doesn't go beyond that progression. That many of the schools, and I see video, I get video every day of demonstrations in Japan. And I'm watching the koru, and I'm watching the two-man kata. And I'm often like, there's zero intent here. Um, it's just choreography. And there's video on, on this channel where you can go back and see demonstrations of koru going back into the 70s. And when you see them there, there's a lot more intent and intensity in terms of the practice of the two-man forms. Okay? So if you're, you lack that intensity, then you're really not practicing martial arts. Okay? You're practicing a choreographed situation, which really is not going to prepare you for a real situation. Um, the problem in Japan right now is that Japan is one of the safest countries in the world. Same with Okinawa. So there's not that, that need, um, that worry that when they're walking home from the dojo that they could be attacked. Um, you know, it's very safe. There's virtually no violent crime. Um, so there's not that impetus, that reason to train to prepare for a real situation. The problem is it's up to the individual sensei of each one of those dojo to impart to the students the importance of that serious training, of that training that has intent where the attacker has to actually try to attack and the defender has to be able to defend. And if he can't defend, well, he's got to step up his game and he's got to practice more and get to the point where he can defend against that attack. So often uh, I hear the knock, well, these ancient arts are a waste of time. Um, you're defending against a sword attack or you, you're defending against attacks that really don't translate into modern times. And, you know, sometimes that's a valid argument. I'll agree. There are, um, you know, several techniques within um, Sosui Shitsuru Kata where you might say, hmm, why, why, would I, why would I do this? And again, you have to realize when the kata were made. In the case of Sosui Shitsuru, you know, we're talking roughly 400 years ago. So again, the, the, the situations they were dealing with back then are different than what we're dealing with now. So the, the other thing that should be going on, in my opinion, with kata practice within the realm of, let's say, an art like Sosui Shitsuru, okay, is the present headmasters... Um, should be creating new kata. New kata to deal with the type of attacks that we deal with in modern times. Okay? I'll be brutally honest with you. In Sosui Shitsuru, I created two different sets of kata that I teach to my students. One is a set specifically designed for law enforcement, handcuffing techniques. Okay? The other set is designed against modern weapons, knife and the gun. Okay? The handcuffing techniques I actually demonstrated in front of the headmaster of Sosui Shitsuru, and he was shocked that so many of the techniques, he was like, but, oh, that's, that's, that's like, this. I can't believe how many of the texts of Sosui Shitsuru you're using in uh, these kata you created. And you know, my answer to him was, is, um, all I did was adapt those same techniques into the modern situation of how to do it. The other thing I'll mention is, is, the techniques I developed um, and created that set of kata are based upon the techniques I used for real first. So the order was, I used those handcuffing techniques in real situations. And then I figured out a way to codify them and put them in a kata. And with the weapons techniques, um, some of those situations I was not in in actual combat but all of those techniques and the way they're used, I had to use them in actual combat and brought that into the two-man uh, self-defense set of kata I created um, for Sosu Ishido. Um, you know, 
you'll hear students say, why train um, in an art like Katori Shintoru, um, 600 years old, doesn't have any modern relevance. Um, it has a lot of modern relevance if the intent is there in the attacks. And I can tell you in the Sugino Dojo, um, the intent is there in the attacks. Um, you go to Japan, you train at that dojo. When someone's going to cut your neck, they're going to cut your neck. <laughs> it's as simple as that. If they're going to cut your arm, they're going to cut your arm. So it's up to you to do the proper response and move in the correct way so you don't get um, cut. The other aspect of the two-man uh, training of kata, and this should be across the board, whether it be koru in Japan, whether it be uh, kobudo in Okinawa, where you're working two-man sets with the weapons. Okay. If your partner makes a mistake or moves improperly, you should go off script. So um, I'll give you an example. Um, I was doing a set of kata with Sugino Sensei, and I was responding to uh, his move, and he was stabbing me every time. And that wasn't the form, but he kept stabbing me. And I kept doing it over and over, and he just kept looking at me like he wouldn't, he wouldn't say. And then I, I, I tried something different, and then he continued the form. And then he stopped, and then he showed me why what I was doing would result in me being killed, right? So if we were just practicing choreography, he would have just kept right on going. And I couldn't tell you how uh, often this has happened. And I've seen since I do this with other people. Um, there was a situation where there was someone visiting um, the seminar up in Canada, and we we're doing Naganata training. And since I kept stabbing the person that was using the Naganata, and he probably stabbed him three or four times. Um, after the second time, the guy turned and looked at me, but he was senior to me, and he wasn't from our group, so I was like, well, it's not my place to say anything. And after the fourth or fifth time, um, he turned and looked at me again. And Sugino, I looked at Sugino Sensei, and Sugino Sensei gave me the nod, like, explain to him why he's getting stabbed every time. And I explained to him and showed him why. So obviously, he'd been making that mistake in the dojo he trained in for a long time, and he wasn't a beginner. Um, and obviously, the person that he's training with, senior or not senior, was not seeing that opening. So my students in New York, um, you know, the dojo in Arizona is still too new. I only have beginners in Katori. But my students in New York, I have people out of training a long time, same amount of time as me with uh, Sugino Sensei. So when I go there, um, they always say that um, the kata gets ratcheted up. The intensity of the kata, you know, goes from a five to a nine. Now when I'm doing the attacks. And initially, they're, you know, they're, 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 they're a little herky-jerky. They're overreacting. They're doing things they shouldn't be doing. And, and again, I tell them, you know, well, you know, you guys have to, when I'm not here, you have to turn it up a little bit sometimes. And, you know, the key thing is it's not about turning it up all the time. Sometimes you practice slowly to make sure your distance is correct. You practice slowly to make sure your positions are correct. Um, you practice slowly to make sure you're moving in the most efficient manner. And then through that constant correcting and practicing, and now you say, okay, let's turn it up for a set. And let's see if we can maintain that technical ability. And as you're able to do that, and you say, okay, well, let's turn it up a little more. Let's, let's turn it up more. And, you know, that's the progress and the process and training of the two-man kata. Um, many times I see with two-man kata that the attack is not going for the person you are training with. The, the focus point is in between the two opponents. So you're not attacking for the person, you're attacking for this space in between them. And I see this even amongst uh, senior people when I review video of people doing uh, two-man kata. And it's a, a huge problem in Okinawa and Kobudo, um, where no one goes for attacks. The action all takes place in this space between the two attackers. Okay? Um, 
So the thing is, is if you're not going for a specific target, um, the person that's working on the defense is not defending against a real attack. It's just, it's fake. It's totally fake. And you're not really getting much out of it other than slamming weapons into each other. So the key is um, the distance is extremely important in practicing two-man kata. Um, and you have to attack to an actual target, not to this imaginary space in between two opponents. Okay? And if you do these things, you're, you'll be rewarded with your two-man kata practice really going up a notch. And if you say, well, I'm not interested in that, I'm just going to keep doing the way I'm doing it, that's fine. But you're fooling yourself if you think you're practicing real martial arts, because you're not. Okay? Um, you know, I was training one time all day in the Jodo Dojo and Yoyogi, all day. I started at like 7.30 in the morning, and by this time it was like 3 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon. I had a break for lunch, a break here and there, but I was training all day, and uh, I was tired. And... Uh, the sensei came down, and he grabbed the boken, and he stood in front of me and said, uh, you know, dozo, please. And I said, okay. And we started doing a set, and I just completely drew a blank for a second. And he hit me. He hit me um, with the cut, with the boken. And I'd never seen him break Zan Shin, and he broke Zan Shin because he was so shocked because he gave me a good shot. Um, l luckily... You know, my body was, I was younger. I could take it, right? I had a bruise the next day, but that was it. But, uh, and I said, I said, uh, Suma Masan, excuse me. I said, please, uh, you know, can we do that again? And went again, and, you know. And afterwards, when I was finished, he said to me, uh, tired? And I said, no, Sensei, because I would never admit that I was tired, right? And then he told me uh, to sit, right? Um, he knew I was tired, because he'd never seen me where I had that lapse, right? But um, it can happen. But the reason I'm telling you about that lapse is, is, he hit me. It wasn't like he was going for some space in front of me. No, he was going for target. He physically struck my body. Okay. And again, it was a wake up call for me and the rest of the set of kata, believe me, I was on my toes and I was ready to go. So this is very important. So um, when practicing two man kata, it's important to follow all these different things I just laid out and you'll see your practice rewarded. Let's talk about solo kata. So, I heard all the time when I first started, and I still hear it, oh, kata should be like a fight. Kata should be like a fight. It's the most ridiculous statement people can make. Kata is nothing like a fight. When you're practicing a form, it looks nothing like a fight. It shouldn't look anything like a fight. There are reasons you practice solo forms, and here are what they are. You're practicing solo forms because it's one of the only few things where you can actually practice full power all out 100% and not be concerned with hurting somebody, okay? Simple as that, all right? As I've gotten older, okay, a lot of my training is forms training. I still do a lot of partner stuff, but I practice a lot of forms training, and I, I can go all out in that forms training, okay? When I'm practicing Nippon Kamite with someone, especially someone at my level, I feel that I'm always dumbing it down for myself, right? That the student needs me to be in front of him because now, you know, he's training with the, the sensei, the, the head of the dojo, right? It's important for him to experience that. And I train with all my different students, right? Um, but for, on my end, I always feel I'm, I'm dumbing it down a little bit. Um, so why practice solo kata and why are we getting that practice? Uh, what are we getting out of that practice? Well, one, for my karate friends, you all practice the forms fast too often. You're always going full speed, full power. Great, okay, but the problem is, is you need to slow down sometimes and you need to go through the form slow and check yourself. Are you out of balance? Are you always moving in balance? When you go from move to move, are your movements smooth or are you wobbly, okay? Are you loading up? In other words, winding up to do your techniques. No good. Beginner, when we do reference points, we say, bring the arm up here and come down with the low block. That's fine. Later on, no, no, no. There should be no wind up. Your hand moves, just moves to the spot. Work your focus in the air, striking to a specific area in the air, hitting that same spot every time. The practice of solo kata is all about proper body mechanics. Is my body in a per as perfect position as it can be every single time I move? 
This is why kata is important. One of my sensei in Okinawa once said to me, never put fighting in the kata. Put kata in the fight. So what he meant by that was is when you start trying to make a move in kata look like the way it looks in a fight, the body mechanics go all out the window. They just go out the window. So now you're practicing poor body mechanics, which now you're not utilizing kata for the purpose it was created for. Kata is about practicing structure. In the Chen style Taiji Chuan practical method that I study under Master Chen Zhanghua, the first form is called the Yilu form. The Yilu form is referred to as the structure form. It's to make your structure as strong and powerful as possible. So that means when you issue power, your structure is like a stone fortification. Um, one of the things we say is if you're able to maintain your structure in the fight, the opponent's structure has to break. His, his, his structure can't hold up, so you're able to destroy his structure and defeat him as long as you can maintain your structure, your proper body mechanics, okay? You're issuing power in a way that doesn't throw you off balance, okay? These are all very important things in kata training. I watch a lot of people do karate. I see a lot of winding up. Um, forget the balance issues. I'm seeing them move off balance all the time, okay? It's important. You know, you look at the Kempo Gokui. The Kempo Gokui says the body must be able to change directions at all times. Doesn't say some of the times, doesn't say most of the times. That means whenever you move in kata, right, you need to check yourself and say, hey, can I move in another direction? Okay. So these are important things to look at and take a hard look at. Some other importance of the kata using proper body mechanics. A lot of my martial arts friends are getting knee replacement and hip replacement, um, a lot of them. Um, uh, why? This is a problem because of a training method. So, you know, I say all the time, and I've mentioned this in the past, um, I hear all the time, oh, we should have a, you know, a promotion board. That's what we should have. So the promotions can be more correct. Um, what we need is um, an intervention in karate, and we need to have and figure out why people that practice karate are getting so much hip and knee replacement. Um, I myself have a knee injury, a knee problem. I was born with it. Um, none of my other joints I have any issues with. The only joint I have a problem with is my left knee. Um, because it's something I was born with. My kneecap sits on the wrong ankle, it's created inflammation. Might I eventually need knee replacement? I might, but it's not because of karate, because my right knee is really good, and also my left knee has no tears or anything. It's strictly inflammation and arthritis from the way my kneecap moves in the track. So when I train kata, I try to do no movements that cause problems in my body. I try to move in a way where my body doesn't create a problem, a future problem for itself. I try to train in a way that causes no injury. Have I gotten injuries? Of course, anything. Anything you do that involves any type of athleticism. At some point, you're going to pull something, twist something, you know, possibly break something. You, you're going to cause, obviously, have some types of injuries. You can't train 45 years like I have now and say, oh, I've never been hurt, okay? Um, but the other thing I'll tell you, I've never taken time off. Other than a handful of times where I, I had a surgical procedure or something like that, or uh, I was injured where I was recommended, okay, shut it down for a few weeks. Other than that, I've never taken time off. I train all the time. I still, to this day, I train pretty much every day. Um, you know, again, as I've gotten older, changed a little bit in the way I train. Um, but the uh, single man kata is vitally important to reaching high levels of martial arts because of the uh, body mechanics dynamic. This is why we train single person kata. This is why it's important, okay? Um, if you're not sure of the proper body mechanics, 
Well, you should look into it, okay? Um, because it's vitally important. If your body mechanics are wrong, practicing that way for years and years and years, eventually you're going to have some physical problems. Um, you know, and a lot of these physical problems can be avoided if you take a hard look at what you're doing. Um, you know, if you're doing training that causes problems for you physically and, you know, you're waking up and you're, you're banged up all the time, not good, okay? Um, you know, you want to practice um, your kata um, where the body's very upright, there's no wobble in the body, there's no wobble side to side in the stances. Um, you know, uh, if you're wobbly all over the place, if you're doing these big wind-ups, um, you know, you can see on my channel some senior Ishinru people. Now, granted, some of them, it's a long time ago. Um, um, I'll, I'll mention one in particular, uh, Master Weizu, Angi Weizu. I love Master Weizu to death. I trained with him on many an occasion. Um, I think he's a phenomenal individual, and I think he did a lot for Ishinru Karate. But he also created some problems. Um, he became, he wanted to emphasize power, and he became about doing these massive wind-ups um, when he practiced the kata. And you can see this, you know, on my channel. Um, this created a problem because a lot of people in Ishinru want to do the kata like he did. The only problem is, is it's not good. That's not the way. And if you watch Tatsu Shimabuku do the kata, you'll see there's none of these wind-ups, okay? Um, so... If you're doing these massive wind-ups, I can tell you now um, it's not good, and eventually it's going to cause you problems physically. Okay? The idea is the movement at a, a higher level, you don't move as much, and you create bigger power. So the goal is to have what we call short-distance power. Okay? Um, to be able to throw the punch a very short distance, right? And generate, generate tremendous amount of power in that short distance okay if you're unable to do that and you can only generate power with these big massive wind-ups um you haven't trained properly and you're definitely not practicing your kata right um so in closing kata is a vitally important aspect of your training okay um the naysayers oh it's bs uh, you got to spar more. You got to do this. You got to do that. All those things are important. Partner practice is vitally important too. It's all important. It's all part of the overall training regimen for these different martial arts. But with all due respect, um, an art like Katori Shintoru, which has been around for 600 years, whose um, students have engaged in life and death con uh, combat for hundreds of years, uh, the 12th headmaster of So Suishiru Jiu Jitsu was killed in the Saigo Rebellion. Okay? So, mm -hmm. with all due respect, uh, these arts were forged in the fires of combat. They practiced two man kata. Okay? Um, the Chinese arts, Chen style Tai Chi Chuan, is 400 years old. All right? Um, it made its bones, so to speak. Uh, as one of the arts protecting caravans along China's trade routes, all right, against bandits trying to rob uh, the merchants, all right? Okay, you know. So the goal is, and the thing is, to understand why these ancients created these forms. They're very smart. There's a lot of things in the forms, including combat tactics, not just body mechanics and how to move properly, but combat tactics are hidden in there. And there's many things you can learn if you really take a deep dive into the kata. Forget about the fighting applications. Forget about it. I can spend three hours on the opening move of Seisan. All right? So, um, again, when you're practicing the fighting applications, it doesn't have to look like the kata. Make it work. Make it work in a fighting situation. But when you're practicing the forms, work on those proper body mechanics. Body mechanics on the key. Hope you've enjoyed this one. Um, I can't emphasize the, emphasize the importance of kata training. Um, very important. The ancients knew what they were doing. Um, if you liked this podcast, please like, share, subscribe. Um, I'm going to include a link for the... Um, 
Push Hands and app Fighting Applications Workshop with Master Chen Zhanghua at my school in July. And uh, see you on the next one. Thanks. Have a great day.